Welcome to Challenging Silence, a podcast from Women's Health in Women's Hands Community Health Center. On this show, we are having much needed discussions about topics related to female genital mutilation or cutting with survivors, advocates, and community members. We're your hosts, Tommy Lola and Nanti. Challenging Silence is brought to you by the Flourish Project, made possible through funding from Women and Gender Equality Canada. You can listen to this podcast series on all major podcast listening platforms and our website, flourishaccess.ca. Please note that this podcast covers topics of a sensitive nature, including domestic abuse and violence. To ensure privacy and safety, some guests have chosen to remain anonymous. This podcast is age appropriate for 16 plus. Canada is home to over 8 million immigrants and hundreds of thousands of which come from countries where female genital mutilation is a documented practice. Although there are laws in Canada set in place to prosecute individuals who perform or aid in the performance of FGMC, Within immigrant communities, there are many Canadian-born girls at risk of undergoing the practice, whether that is secretly here in Canada or when their parents take them abroad. Dr. Bilkis Vizanji joins me today as a co-host for our episode about protecting and safeguarding girls at risk. Welcome, Dr. Vizanji, and please introduce our guests for today. Bonjour, Tomilola. Thank you for uh, having me. Thank you for inviting us. And this is really an honor that we today are able to have a different twist from the various other podcasts that uh, you have carried out. So today we are blessed to have a specific lens on uh, immigration. Of course, when we talk about the topic of female genital cutting, we are looking at a population that is originally coming from selected countries where it is known to be of high prevalence of the practice. Of course, I'm a bit hesitant here because I would like to make sure that we choose the right words to say the right things. And the elements referring to prevalence are estimates, and which is why I want to make sure that we say the right things. And so we need to understand what happens when it comes to immigration experiences, when it comes to women, girls, families coming from countries where the practice happens to a country like Canada. And we have the pleasure today to be able to listen to Maître Annick Legault. She is a lawyer of at least 19 years of experience in immigration and refugee challenges, especially, of course, to Canada. It's been almost now three years that she's been involved very actively looking at uh, one of the objectives of the GenderNet project, where we had the opportunity with her leadership to better understand what happens when a girl or a woman is asking asylum to Canada and all the complexities we to get to that. In addition to be a lawyer, she recently inaugurated a clinic and she is a co-founder as well as the current president and it's called Migrant Justice Clinic. Welcome, Maître Annick Legault. Thank you, Binkis. Thank you, Tamilola, for having me. I'm very honored. Thank you. So one of your expertise is to really attend to the safeguards issues and especially safeguarding girls by informing those who don't know who is exactly at risk of FGMC when we're talking about the Canadian soil. I want to start the conversation about your perceptions, your thoughts on what exists here in Canada about safeguarding girls Well, from an immigration and refugee lawyer's perspective, one of the safeguards would be to help young females who enter Canada with their parents. And we do have the refugee system that can definitely prevent them by granting them asylum to make sure that they're not returned to a country where the risk exists. 
So that is definitely one of the options. So for Canadian-born children or children, for instance, migrants who come to Canada who claim asylum but have children who are American, for instance, who will not be granted refugee status, but it would still be at risk because if the parents were to be deported, I give an example in Nigeria, the children would follow. There are other immigration mechanisms that maybe we can, we can attempt in order to protect them as well. But then while there would be the whole aspect of education, you do have sometimes even parents who come here for another reason, and then after they're given status, choose to return. So the mechanisms are supposedly, and I say supposedly because in effect have not been used, would be our criminal system and or a youth protection system. But both, in my humble opinion, are extremely flawed. Uh, the best way to have people not share their fears or not share their preoccupations is to threaten them with uh, criminal procedures or threaten them with um, the sanctions or taking children away or whatnot. So I'm not too sure how these other mechanisms supposedly there to protect would in effect protect. I do think that mainly the best way to protect would be to actually just through education and the whole process of migrants arriving here is awareness and that different aspects. So the mechanisms per se, I find them not the best, definitely. Uh, I do think that explaining to people that it is a crime in Canada to have your daughter undergo this type of mutilation it, well, is a crime, basically, to maybe share a position that indeed the Canadian population has chosen. It is a crime. But nevertheless, I'm not too sure that uh, these mechanisms or these spaces are actually effective in helping young girls being prevented from any type of mutilation, actually. Thank you very much. That sets really the stage for, you know, understanding what the context, what the, the legal context is in Canada. Can you talk to us about where does Canada stand in terms of the United Nations High Commissioner for Refugees recommendation in terms of gender in, in refugee law? Well, in our immigration and refugee law, there's nothing per se on gender, right, apart from refugee definition that includes a variety of groups. And in those groups, we identify, for instance, gender, but FGM is not specifically. What happens, though, is that we have specific guidelines on gender. And in the past, anyway, those guidelines did include specifically FGM as being a gender type persecution. I think Canada has always been a pioneer when it came to recognizing different gender-specific violences. Does So, I mean, I don't think that we're not going by UN standards. The UN have not made any specific comments on FGM. What they have done, I think it was the end of the 19, uh, 2008, they produced a document specifically addressing female genital mutilation. They did, um, but that document, the federal court here in Canada said it was a very significant document, important to be mentioned and to be assessed when we have that type of case that is brought before the Immigration and Refugee Board, which is the board that here. Uh, refugee claims. So, I mean, I think Canada is quite where it, it should be. But the difficulty we have more is that because a lot of times girls come with their parents, it's just automatically presumed that because parents say no, hence they can protect their daughters from it happening instead of really understanding the logistics and how it can happen. The people who li your listeners know of how this happens, but a lot of times I think Canadian people, other types of people who are not familiar with FGM could not understand that even if the parents say no, well, when, you know, during spring break, summer break, whatever break, they go to the, they go to the village and I mean, their little girl comes back to them and it has happened. So a lot of times I don't think parents consent necessarily changes anything. So um, that reality is not always understood and or as well the social stigma associated to it, the psychological pressure, the social stigma, being scared of isolation, being scared of not being part of their group, uh, identifying to their elders, to their peers. 
So all of that can be put as well a young girl, even though her parents are saying no to her to want to do it or her to acquiesce and follow through with the procedure. Exactly. And I think you really are unraveling complexities, you know, around who, when, and how. I will ask just to own back in a comment that you had made you had spoken of consent in terms of parental consent and how at times the parents themselves are not necessarily giving consent for the procedure to happen on their daughters, especially in the cases of vacation cutting. And to give our listeners a little bit of context, vacation cutting is the act of family members taking a girl back to their country of origin or country where FGMC is known to be practiced. And this usually occurs during a summer vacation when they have months away from school. We know that in Canada, the law since May 1997, FGMC has been an illegal practice. And that includes whether it is performed here on Canadian soil or whether a parent or adult takes a young girl outside of the country. Why do you think even though with the laws in Canada, there's still girls who are at risk of vacation cutting? And how is the laws not completely protecting them? Because we do have this law, but we can see that it's not a 100% safeguard for girls. Mm -hmm. Well, actually, I'm not even sure if it has any effect at all, right? Because To my knowledge, I did not check in the last couple of days, but there were no convictions under Section 268 of the Criminal Code. So, um, and we do know, without knowing how many, but we do know that vacation cutting, as you call it, happens. So clearly, (laughs) you have a law and no one's ever been convicted of it. So that says a lot. I would presume that anybody, after being told that it's a crime here, but knows about that, that in itself does, why would that change? I mean, what kind of incentive is it? And then you can say, though, how about youth protection? Because that would be the biggest open door, right? Because youth protection do have girls who come to them and who are in this situation, or do have girls who are at risk of traveling in the summer and how things happen. But because of all the intricacies that I mentioned earlier, I'm not so sure anybody's keen on just coming out before and just trying to accuse a parent without knowing, because you do have to understand that the only way you can accuse someone is if if actually the little girl was cut, right? So you're not able to accuse under the criminal code for the parent who's thinking of sending the child abroad. And how would you be able to prove that that's what's going to happen. I mean, it does make sense for a lot of people who are here and have family abroad to go in the summer. And that's actually, when you think about it, it's it's a great experience and it's a great uh, family gathering moment. So I really don't see how this law helps at all, (laughs) but rather creates fear. The idea, though, to say that Canada is against FGM that I think is is okay it's a, it's a, it's a position I agree with that position I'm just not sure criminalizing for instance a parent after traveling how does that help the little girl who's undergone the procedure how does that protect her after they've come back right and then what that means that we have to look at her genitals we have to have her do a medical examination and we have to destroy a family for something that in their environment was sacred. I don't see how that works. So I do believe that it doesn't have a great impact. And if it's still happening today is because I do not think that the, 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 the we're still able to, on a more global way, able to really share our message. So we have to find the proper words to be able to to share our message. I definitely agree with you on that in the fact that having laws in place is not really protecting and safeguarding girls at risk of vacation cutting. And it's not necessarily the way to go about it. And if we do want to do something to prevent this from occurring. 
in your experience working with immigrant communities and as a lawyer, what way do you think the Canadian government can go about this with protecting and safeguarding girls? So away from using this threatening, as he said, mechanism of if you do this, we will prosecute you. But obviously that threat is not working. I think education is the main way. And when I say education, it's not really, it's sharing uh, a, a, a core value and doing everything you can to make sure that you, it, it's not just understood that it's received and it's, it's taken in. Because even if you, and you could even share with children in that context, if the children are not scared that their parents are going to go to prison, and you just do these open focus groups and conversations within schools. I mean, children, when they just arrive, they're in classe d'accueil, they're in specific groups. I mean, you, you share with them and you don't scare them and you give them, you know, you explain to them, you explain to their parents when they're meeting with different government officials at different stages. If the little girl is not scared, she can maybe feel comfortable. Oh, I, I was told that, you know, they're not supposed to do that. I think they want me to go home this summer and maybe it's going to happen. I think we're going to have much more openness if <laughs> things are just shared in a less dogmatic, scary way. Yes, you are definitely right about that. All the, the points that you've just said. And it's similar to the, the goal and aim of the Flourish Project at Women's Health and the goals at RHC for FGC at GenderNet Plus, educating families, children, community members, because really it takes a village to raise a child. So it's not just the parents that need to be educated that type of education and awareness is definitely very important with reaching more people and safeguarding and protecting girls from FGMC. We do that uh, in collaboration. This is why it's uh, a pleasure to have uh, the Flourish Project colleagues at the various with various expertise at the RHC for FGC Genet project and. Um, you know, you uh, were recently writing within the GenderNet project some of the analysis you did on the decisions which are made when it comes to FGM as a ground for claiming asylum in Canada. Can you sort of talk to us a, a little bit about what are the results of some of these analyses that you've done? How credible are uh, the, the various instances to some extent? Well, the the research was specifically on the Refugee Appeal Division, so the decisions that were rendered with regards to female minors, Nigerians, that were before the Appeal Division. So what came out, and only obviously we only had access to the public, the, the decisions that were made public, and that's only a small percentage, I think we're talking less than 5%, so we don't know how like representative it is of the other female minor Nigerian girls fearing FGM or having undergone FGM. So what came out is, for instance, gender guidelines that exist were very rarely being mentioned in the analysis of the decision, as well, what was I guess, in my opinion, uh, a bit more surprising is that even if we're dealing with children, the guidelines on the children were extremely rarely used in reference to, and when they were used, it was solely in the view of uh, just saying that the procedure went as it should be uh, versus actually developing a whole analysis for the children. And this brings me to the point that was the most revealing, which was the little girl's narrative. So their fear of persecution of FGM was very rarely analyzed from their lens. It was from the lens of the parents. So if we didn't believe the parents and we didn't believe whatever they were claiming, well, the daughter's case was dismissed as well. And or we said, well, because the parents can protect her if she goes back so she can move to another area. So if you had any recommendations to give in terms of better training, for instance, uh, I'm thinking of youth protection offices, what would be sort of if we had the infinite means that we, you would recommend? 
I think they should follow <laughs> all these entities, government, but even uh, NGOs should all follow Tamiula and all the brilliant work that they do, her entity and other entities in Canada, I guess some abroad as well, but people just need to be more educated and then figure out ways that they can truly impact parents in when they're, you know, when they're sharing their views against this type of procedure. Because I, I, I think we can't do it anyway in a one set mind. There's no cookie cutter way to actually touch and reach everybody and suggest that this procedure should no longer happen. You need to have a variety of ways to touch and try to change people's minds because different people have different reasons why they want this for their children or they want this as a woman. It was really an enlightening conversation as far as I'm concerned. And I'd like to say thank you to my colleague, Annie, for the time she spent in uh, talking to us about complex issues. We hardly touched upon some of the issues and there's so much more to say. And I'm sure that we'll have other opportunities via the Flourish Project and at the uh, partnership that's building with Women's Health in Women's Hands. So thank you very much again to Milala for uh, inviting us and thank you, Annie. Thank you, Bill, Keith, and Anik for joining us for today's episode. We had a good discussion about safeguarding girls at risk of FGMC and the laws in Canada to protect them. Thank you again for coming to this episode. My pleasure. Join us next week as we talk about anti-FGMC advocacy and survivor empowerment with one of the Flourish Advisory Committee members.